Now, biodiversity data is like the buzzword, right? We do carbon credits to protect biodiversity, forests, and indigenous people. But how do we bring biodiversity data into capitalism? How can we count elephants? How can we make sure that our endangered species are not just slipping away and we have more lost species in the unreadable Latin language IUCN databases? CyberTracker is for us that tool. It's the beginning for the Data Alliance. It's the operating system for indigenous people to collect data and have a spot in our world economy. Louis, please come on stage. We became good friends over one and a half years or something like this. Let me give you a wonderful hug. Thank this, you. This man went through a hard time to get the visa and get over <laughs> here. And I'm very excited to hear your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Marco. Um, yeah, CyberTrack actually started about, we found it in 97 um, as a desktop solution. Um, and in a sense, we were a little bit ahead of the curve. You know, there were no internet connectivity out in the wilds. And uh, it started with one fundamental problem. Now, biodiversity conservation, when we think of carbon credits, we think in terms of the amount of carbon in a piece of forest. Now, slowly, investors are starting to realize, no, but it's not that simple. We need to start thinking of biodiversity. However, biodiversity itself will not be sustainable unless we find sustainable socio-economic solutions for indigenous communities who overlap about 80% of key conservation areas. Now, one of the key problems is that your best indigenous trackers usually cannot read or write. Yet, we, my project started out with the hypothesis that indigenous tracking is equivalent to the same sorry, reasoning processes that is required in physics and mathematics, which incidentally solve a problem in human evolution, is how did we evolve a human brain that can do physics and math? And that I spent about 10 years showing that indigenous trackers, when they interpret tracks and signs, they use the same scientific reasoning, which implies that we should be able to employ them to do good science. The main barrier being that your best trackers can't read or write. So we developed an interface based on icons that allows non-literate or autolite indigenous trackers to capture very complex biodiversity data. Now, that problem we solved back in 96, 97. And over the years, we've encountered the second problem. Now, we've got partnerships with Earth Ranger and Smart Conservation, and it's compatible with ESRI ArcGIS and so on. So we fully integrated with fairly advanced technological solutions. However, my gut feeling is that possibly I'm just off the head, maybe 90% of conservation areas, protected areas, non-profits working on endangered species, um, that, that there's no technical expertise to get things up and running. So what we're now doing with CyberTracker online is we're simplifying it to the point where I want a 10-year-old school child to be able to customize an application that can capture complex biodiversity data. And if we can do that, it means that non-technical people can assist indigenous communities, and in some indigenous communities where young people are gone to school, it'll empower them to create their own apps, to gather their own data, to make scientific contributions, which empowers them to then sell their data to potential data users. The next step is in viewing and interpreting the data. So what we're now doing is the query system is already embedded in the application itself. So when you upload the data, all you do is you tick off a tick box to view a particular animal or a combination of animals. So that is very simple, very intuitive, 
It requires no GIS skills or database uh, management skills to customize the application, gather your data, and then view your data online. That data can then be exported to Excel to, as an ESV shapefile, and um, currently CyberTracker exports about a dozen export files, which allows you to then analyze it in other analytical tools. Um, the next thing is to develop a platform where you'll be able to view all the projects, have a simple description, and then this could then be linked to explorer.land if you want to have um, tell your story and make it more exciting for potential funders. Um, people can upload scientific papers and reports and data so that people can see where the real work is being done in the field. Um, Another fundamental problem that I've encountered over the years, and I hate to say this, but I've encountered this with some of the largest international conservation NGOs, is that it's often very difficult to keep track of where funding is going and what is happening to it. I've seen huge projects where it's claimed that they do enormous work in the middle of the Congo, where I personally were working in the field and know that not a single dollar has actually ended up in that project. So what CyberTrack now can do, we have a very simple accounting system where the communities themselves, so over COVID, I've been sending them money in the Kalari. They report back, and the next month, I send them another chunk of money. And with this app, you can keep track of each dollar being spent, a payment of individual trackers, if they need to buy food supplies, if they need petrol, a photograph of the cash slip, a GPS point at the petrol station. Um, tracker being paid, photograph of the, pa of the pa So this means a funder in London or Zurich or New York can keep track of each dollar being spent in the field. And so it's not just about biodiversity, it's also monitoring the socioeconomic benefits to the community and then having the transparency so that your funders and donors can see exactly where the money is, money is being spent and whether it's doing the job that it's supposed to do. Um, so essentially what I'm proposing is that to create socioeconomic sustainability for biodiversity and ultimately climate change, we need to develop a new business model for indigenous communities that will empower them to manage their own resources, their own finances, and then be able to share that data, for example, with our technology partners at this stage, with ESRI, ArcGIS Online, Smart, Earth Ranger, Kobo, Trillion Trees. So by sharing this data to potential data consumers who will ultimately pay for the data. So the data belongs to the community, it's password protected, and they have the right to share it with whoever they want to work with. Um, now the orange dots here is just an overview of the CyberTracker Classic over the last 20, 25 years. I've actually lost track of it because, you know, it's sort of a, we've had more than 600,000 downloads and people download it, they use it. Um, it's sort of difficult to keep track of who's doing what. Most of it, I think, is in individual researchers. Um, so transitioning now to CyberTracker Online, the blue dot is our flagship project in the Kalahari. And then in addition, now with the Data Alliance, we're now working, starting a project um, with the data lines in Kenya and in Sudanama, and then working from there. Um, because CyberTracker Online is basically uh, a free uh, service, uh, by having a few high-profile success stories, it then just replicates itself um, globally. Um, lastly, it's not just thank you to the Nature Alliance and NOAA, but personally to Marco, who's been funding the development of CyberTracker online over the last year out of his own pocket, um, which is not insignificant. Um, and for the investors out there, I think it's not just to help me, but help Marco, you know? <laughs> I'm going to bankrupt him pretty soon if it goes on like this. So I think thank you, Marco, for getting CyberTracker online up and running by 
January, February, the minimum viable product should be ready for release, but then we still need to build out the platform over the next three to five years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.